Hi, everyone. It's Grant Abbott speaking, and thanks a lot for um, turning over this session. Um, these uh, sessions are really important um, and brought to you both by Lightyear um, Docs and also Abbott Morley. Um, both uh, organisations are, are growing quite considerably, and you can see uh, with Lightyear um, that we aren't really taking a um, backward step in terms of providing documents. If you have a look at most of our competitors, they might have like 50 or 60 documents on their platform. Uh, we've got 150, but a lot of those, uh, if, you've, if you've seen my Moten Castle or Success Director, you know, we're at that, that leading edge of, of documentation. And it's a really important time. And I'm putting my Abbott Morley hat on at the moment. I want to give you a, a good heads up session today on, on what, um, if you're an accountant or tax agent, what you can and cannot advise on in terms of um, the whole um, scheme of things or all of our documents um, in the platform. Uh, for those of you who are SEPEPA advisors, um, you know, say hello and I uh, just want to let you know that uh, we've, um, we'll be releasing very shortly. Uh, we have our international conference uh, from the 13th and 14th of November. So pencil that in, that's going to be in Fiji. So you're going to have a, um, and, and that in itself is going to be revolutionary in terms of what we're bringing to the table for you uh, in terms of marketing, um, help, support and all of that. So uh, the association is unlike, you know, many other associations, we're there to support you and build your businesses, which is fantastic. But it's not just myself or Tim or Michael or whatever. It's the, the whole kick caboodle. Um, so I wanted to go through a, a lot there and, and really um, give you an update of, of where the, the, you know, where the lines are drawn, etc. So there's going to be quite a bit. Um, <laughs> so I've actually done it the reverse way, but let's go through. Um, that's a bit of a younger um, picture of me. God, I was a bit skinny there, but um, I'm not sure if I was that healthy, but uh, that was in my SMSF members' days. Um, I, I want to go in and um, each each time we do one of these sessions, if you're with me, um, with someone else not, I just want to do each session you come to me just to give you an idea of um, where your knowledge level um, sits. And if you've been training with me before, you know there's the four levels of uh, competency and skills, which are absolutely crucial. So the first level is unconsciously incompetent. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of those people out there. Uh, next one is consciously incompetent is that, you know, you're well aware of your limitations. You're feeling a bit overwhelmed about things, um, but you've got a desire to learn more. And that that desire, that passion is, is really crucial. And with that takes us up to the next level, which is consciously competent. So we we put in the hard yards and you don't want to be spending time honestly doing rubbish CPD. It just doesn't make sense. When you're doing CPD or training, you want to be there in that spot, in that moment, because all of that information gets downloaded. And particularly if you're dealing with me, it gets downloaded into your subconscious mind. So it can be brought up and analyzed at a later stage. So that's absolutely crucial. But we want to make a bit of a, a check for you, see how you go, whether you get it right or wrong. So these are six questions, and I'm just it's just right or wrong. So each one, you can tell me how you go. It'll be a bit of fun anyway. But look, learning should be fun, and we're going to learn a lot um, today. So let's have a look at the first question. Um, a client asked their accountant to set up a self-managed super fund. The accountant tells the client they cannot advise on SMSFs. So is that right or is that wrong? So... If you picked wrong, thumbs up. So that's completely wrong. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit later on the asset guidance note on that one. However, um, it is a, here's the deal. It is a myth that has been promulgated by the um, uh, AVSL licensees for the last probably maybe since 2016. So we're looking at six years now in order to limit the ability of accountants to grow self-managed super funds. And also we've, we can see it. So we had a look at the growth of SMSFs um, in the SMSF specialist course. Um, and the if you had a look around about six years ago to now, we've probably only added about 30,000 SMSFs 
because there's a lot of people going in and a lot of people going out for it's just because it's bad planning. But um, the amount sitting in self-managed super funds has gone from around about you know 700 to 870 billion dollars. So it's been growing for those people that are there. And a lot of it's because accountants have shied away from that SMSF sector. Um, if you're involved in that succession asset protection estate planning space, SMSFs are generally by far the best across all of those lines. The only problem is obviously access to superannuation monies. And we've got lots of strategies for that one, uh, particularly if it'll be interesting to see if um, and look, I'm not a, I can, I can tell you the truth, I'm not going to vote for either of those parties. Um, I'd rather vote for my cat at the moment. But in terms of self managed super funds, self preservation, definitely um, the Liberal Party is going to be a lot stronger than the Labor Party. Um, essentially, they're there for the industry funds, as you can see. But anyway, that's, I don't want to get on that soapbox there. Um, an accountant advises a client to set up a leading member discretionary trust to protect family wealth for bloodline. Can an accountant at law set up a discretionary trust? So you go online, you know, you just set up a discretionary trust. I mean, if we have a look at it, probably around about maybe you know, 500,000 discretionary trusts have been set up through online platforms, whether Clear Docs, uh, whether it's Lightyear Docs, um, now Infinity, you know, there's a whole, whole range of those. So look at, at law, um, again, it's just a structure there. Um, and it's not so much the structure, it's actually the, we'll see a little bit later on, it's going to be the preparation of the document. If the document you're preparing, or sorry, you're, you're delivering to your client is simply a um, template uh, and um, there's legal sign off in terms of that template, you'll see a little bit later on, there's no difference between you providing that um, to the client um, and a paralegal who doesn't need to be um, a lawyer providing that. So uh, there's a lot of uh, flexibility in that. Whereas if I can just say that um, if you just got a template uh, and has been a court case on this one uh, where you get a, a template, um, you then um, get it in PDF. And the reason they're in PDF is so that you can't make any changes. You make changes in the template that then voids the template. Uh, you then get that template, um, turn it into a Word document and start to add uh, a range of clauses in there, then quite clearly you're preparing a legal document. So again, we've got to be looking at that one, but um, definitely if you're just doing the basic one, absolutely. Uh, can an accountant set up a discretionary trust? Right. Um, probably should be yes, um, but right. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, the sole director of a company established by an accounting firm goes into liquidation on the death of the director because there was no replacement director. So the Again, ASIC, you know, none of us are um, children here. We know that, you know, the potential there is um, uh, effectively uh, a position that if there's no one to pay salary wages or deal with the uh, bank account, it's a bit of a, a tough one. So it goes into liquidation um, and the executor, can the executor take action against the accountant for recovery of losses? Um, I would say absolutely um, they can. So right, they can take an action against the accountant, particularly uh, when ASIC has, it, if the accountant was the corporate agent um, and holding themselves out as um, expert in this field, um, then absolutely, if it's, an, it'd have to be under the tort of negligence. And we've seen quite a big um, lengthening in that over the last few years with Cam and Bear, um, SMSF auditors. If it's in the SMSF a corporate trustee, absolutely. So you could use the super, you, you recover from the SIS Act anyway. Um, so you've just got to be very careful on that, uh, particularly when ASIC released a guideline way back in 2010 um, saying that this is an issue to be addressed. Now, it's impossible for all of us, of course, to you know, be on top of everything that comes out, but you know, that's, that's what I love doing anyway to find out. Um, uh, four, a tax agent advises a client on using a contribution suspense account to maximise 2022 deductions and not breach the concessional cap. So we're going to be talking about that. I, I think I've got a contribution section um, session, strategy session about three or four weeks, um, which will be really uh, a cracker. So what we're going to look there is now putting in um, for clients uh, $55,000 of uh, contributions uh, 27 and a half this year, the other 27 and a half going up into a suspense account. 
Um, and that's all been signed off by the, the commissioner. In fact, I'm going to show you the regulatory uh, guidelines on his website, which talks about it and what how to um, do it from a technical perspective. His friend tells him that's illegal. Well, that's wrong. So, yeah, absolutely, we can um, do that. Now, contributions to Spence account is not a reserve. Um, it's actually um, the person who came up with this. I used to use reserves, but the commissioner said it's better to do it by way of a Spence account. So if the commissioner says that, happy to use that one. Um, an account creates an enduring power of attorney based on data capture from the client, which enables the attorney to become the trustee of an SMSF. His planner colleague said he needs to be licensed. Um, well, yeah, because it's dealing with an SMSF. Well, we know that that is not correct anyway. Um, creating an enduring power of attorney. Again, if it's just a straight data capture, um, and we'll have a look at the cases on that, then we're A-OK. -okay. Um, six, the lawyer, I love this one, lawyer makes a BDBN for a client that directs death benefits to the estate without elaborating on the risk of a family provisions claim. Um, the executor sues the lawyer for losses. Is that right or wrong? Absolutely. Um, you could go to town on that one um, and in particular um, use the CIS Act because there's strict liability provisions there. Um, I'd, be, I'd definitely be taking um, aim at lawyers and it was a, a good case. In fact, Sue Voss from Victoria just asked me a question you might have seen in the trades where um, in the New South Wales Supreme Court, they used the notional estate to um, uh, withdraw monies from a self-managed super fund. Um, honestly, it was so poorly argued. Um, the solicitors who were involved in the case, you know, their claim to fame is they look after the North Shore mums. And look, anyway, um, I'm not going to go into it, but the, they could have been a bit more robust on their legal arguments. But again, Sue was worried, you know, does that going to impact all BDBNs? First off, you know, my feeling about BDBNs, I think they're rubbish um, and that you need to focus in on SMSF wills. Uh, secondly, um, is that that notional state, that family provisions only applies in New South Wales. It doesn't apply in any other state. So we've got a whole lot of rights and wrongs. Hope you did well on that one. But it's a really good test to have a look at practical situation to see, you know, where our... Um, the, the way our mind works is that we've got, uh, for example, and I'll give you an example, um, we've got in our mind um, that we've picked something up and it becomes a belief. And so the way our mind works is that it, it starts to trigger um, a set of neural pathways. And, and so when we see something, we go, oh, yeah, we know that. And that neural pathway is, is then triggered. But the problem is if that neural pathway, that belief is wrong, then we're triggering, do you mean we're triggering a wrong action, which is important. And look, one of the areas I always like to do is a big one is whether a SMSF can run a business. Not that it should, but if you go to, you know, I'd say 99% of accountants would say no, but if we go to the, um, uh, the tax office um, and the commissioners, you know, issued guidelines that a SMSF provider that meets all the other uh, contribute not the contributions all the other compliance laws uh, can run uh, a business it's not in breach of section 62 so again we want to test where where we are or not um, and that's always a good one so let's go in our uh, first one is for those of you who aren't in Sepepa have a really good look um, and the reason I say that and we'll talk about it a little bit later on is that there's a whole set of competency standards um, because at the end of the day uh, when you, if you ever do get sued or, or particularly around negligence, um, you're going, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's enduring power of attorney, setting up a trust or anything, you need to show that you're competent um, and that the advice you've given is correct. Uh, with SAPEPA, we've got a whole lot of, we've got five sets of competency standards um, dealing with succession asset protection and estate planning. So again, if you can show that you're a member of an association and you've met those standards, then um, effectively you're halfway there. Um, this is an interesting case um, and um, the, that I found, and it's quite detailed. It was actually about the uh, prepayment of deductions in terms of um, the acquisition of an asset. Uh, it was quite an interesting case. Um, there was an accountant and there was also uh, a tax lawyer involved. Um, out of that process, uh, really, when you had a look at it, the commissioner had a win. So uh, the case was about uh, whether it was a reasonably arguable case so that uh, penalties could be waived. But the commissioner was saying, look, it was so 
egregious, the really the um, penalties um, are quite sizable, should be kept. Um, uh, Forgy, Deputy President in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, said on the basis of the evidence, and particularly that of his solicitors, because they didn't go and get formal legal written advice from his solicitors, I find that um, a Mr Sinclair, who was the client in question, the one who did the prepayment, did not approach them for formal legal advice regarding the taxation consequences of the contractual, contractual agreements he had made with Tower Lake. Uh, he did approach Mr Jasper, uh, who's worked uh, with him and the solicitors on the arrangements. Mr Jasper said that the three of them, Mr Sinclair, the solicitor, uh, and he, he himself worked on the matter. I accept his evidence, they all felt that the amount paid as prepaid interest in respect of an activity that produced income would be deductible. Um, it was held not to be deductible because it was acquiring, a, acquiring an asset that was going to produce accessible income. Um, as I found though, the solicitors did not put that in writing and do not admit to giving specific legal advice about the particular arrangement in by Mr Sinclair. Mr Jasper is a fellow of the Tax Institute of Australia, but he could not give legal advice regarding the tax implications of the arrangement. Now, um, that, that needs to be sort of juxtaposed because it's hard to reconcile as an accountant that sort of position um, that, you, that, that appears in this instance. And remember, this isn't a Supreme Court, it's not a full federal court, it's only an AAT decision. Um, and more importantly, it was in relation to the um, obviously administrative penalties that were lodged. So I, I think it, it's probably a bit of an outlier, particularly when we go around and have a look at the, the Tax Agents Act, which many of you are. Um, Section 90 5 provides that a tax agent is um, a tax agent service, which is if you're registered as a tax agent. Um, is any service that relates to ascertaining liabilities, obligations or entitlements of an entity that arise or could arise under a taxation law. So prepayment of interest is, you know, that is, although I must admit they got it wrong, but it didn't matter. Or advising an entity about liabilities, obligations or entitlement of the entity or another entity that, that arise or could arise under tax law or representing an entity in their dealings with the commissioner, which is crucial. And B, there's providing circumstances where the entity can reasonably be expected to rely on the service for either both the following purposes. To satisfy liabilities, obligations that arise or could arise under taxation law, to claim entitlements that arise or could arise under taxation law. Um, a service specified in the regulations, again, is, is not a, there is no regulations around that. So to reconcile again, um, from my perspective in terms of tax, uh, tax agents um, can give advice around virtually anything to do with tax. And I'm talking about companies, discretionary trusts, the big ones coming up at the moment, obviously, we're going to have to look at in terms of contributions. Um, and I'm talking the next six weeks and obviously trust distributions, bearing in mind Section 100A. So we need to be advising there. Uh, my feeling, and I've seen a number of barristers hang their hat on this one saying that really it's got to be lawyers who advise on um, tax arrangements. Uh, my opinion is this is a very, very low decision. It's the only one that I've seen, um, you know, in 20 years. It's 2010. It's an AAT decision. I, uh, look, uh, my feeling is that we've got to really um, apply, uh, you know, the Tax Agent Services Act. Importantly from that one, um, the, the explanatory of memorandum does give us a bit of insight, though, which I think we need to, to take into account. Uh, we're an agent after consulting the relevant authorities and sources, which is cases and, you know, talking to people such as myself, is still uncertain how to apply taxation law. The agent may choose to seek assistance from another party, such as another agent, a legally qualified professional, a recognised professional association or recognised BAS agent, a legal professional association of the ATO. So that, that sort of even goes further to show that, um, you know, it's not all about lawyers. It's There's a whole range of sources we can get in order to further our information or, or advice around that. So, again, uh, my feeling is this Sinclair is probably just a little bit of a, um, a negation for that. Um, I've just got a couple of questions that I'll look at and then we'll get into uh, accounts and super. Um, so, again... Um, can non-accountants and advisors also recommend strategies and create documents for clients? Again, there's, there's no different. It depends. Um, 
and you'll see when we get to, I'm going to do accounts and super now, and then we're going to do um, the legal services side. Again, if it's from a data capture, um, you'll see under uh, legal services that that is not a uh, provision of a legal service. Um, if you're just simply taking that data capture and you're putting it into um, an online portal or alternatively, many of you have probably gone through in the old days and, you know, done a, um, a PDF and, you know, you've written all the client details or faxed it in and got a company or a trust there. Again, you're just simply providing that information into the portal that will then spit out. So really, um, the the element there is it really depends on on that portal and, and the legal sign off in re relation to that and it doesn't matter because um, this is why paralegals who prepare documents um, generally are, are not don't need to be lawyers to provide legal service because they take the data and they then prepare the documents so in that one um, you don't need to be an accountant or an advisor to do that one as well. Um, uh, I've been asked a lot by referring accounts and mortgage brokers, who does the risk lie with if an accounting, uh, account and accounting firm has recommended a particular strategy, um, e.g. bloodline, will, EPOA, AFCD, and later on someone makes a claim that was inappropriate for some reason, given the fact that data may have been a result of a data capture form completed by the client, but the specific strategy document created as a result of a recommendation made by the accountant? Absolutely. So... That's a, that's a really good point. So we're moving away from the documentation now to actually look at um, the advice we're given. So um, if we have a look, a uh, classic one would be, for example, which sort of in between is, is Cam and Bear, which was a case, um, I think in 2019 or 2018, which dealt with a SMSF auditor um, who had signed off um, compliance and finance wise that, uh, there was an amount on the balance sheet which was shown as cash. Uh, but when you dug down into the uh, balance sheet, um, in fact, if you look beyond the balance sheet, uh, which was prepared by the accountant, in fact, it was actually um, a loan to a, an entity which then failed. Uh, and then the trustee of the SMSF took action against the auditor and, and won in that regard. Uh, so again, that's just simply showing negligence. So when it comes around to negligence, Nathan, it's it's really important. So we use the, the reasonable uh, man test on that one. So we're looking at the law of equity, not common law. Um, CIS Act is completely different. So if we're looking at that is we, we need to do a, um, a position whereby um, is it reasonable? Was the advice reasonable? Um, given the knowledge level of, of what would be expected of an accountant or tax agent at that time. And that, that's the same thing as though if we go back and have a look at the Tax Agent Act, it's all fine, but if the person gives shoddy advice like they did in Sinclair, then effectively there's potentially a negligence action against them, which is, again, why it's really important. Um, and, and most of you know my feeling I'm passionate about education. The more education you can get, um, the better because you're not going to slip up so much. So it doesn't matter whether you're doing an EPOA or doing whatever or a bloodline will, I mean, or sort of bloodline uh, like a leading member trust. If you tell your client, well, this trust does an ordinary discretion trust, this does that. And really, how do you know the difference? Well, at the end of the day, that's because Abbott Morley have said this does that. So if it doesn't do that or doesn't protect the bloodline, then that's an Abbott Morley issue. It's not your issue because we have, we've recommended, well, we've said that this is what um, it does in terms of form and manner of that document. Now, if you, for example, if a client comes to you and says, I want asset protection, um, like a, a classic one that uh, a lot of accountants potentially have to watch out for now is if a client's come to you and asked for asset protection um, and then the accountant has basically uh, put the asset in the wife's name, being the non-risk um, uh, non partner, uh, but the money's come from the joint bank account, um, the deposit, you know, there's a loan in between, you know, for both of them, as there was in Bosnac, then quite clearly um, that, that asset protection advice, which was directed to the client, um, that is ineffective um, at law. And then you look through and you say, well, reasonably, would anyone expect 
um, that the money is coming jointly from one element to another that by putting in the wife's name, the husband has no interest in it. And you probably have to say no, and particularly now you've got Bosnac. And Bosnac is, is quite legendary because although it deals with tax debts, it's going to apply with executors, it's going to apply with family, it's going to apply with everything. So again, um, Nathan, hopefully that um, answered your position. But um, again, the, getting those competency standards up and showing that um, you have met those competency standards certainly makes a, a big difference. Um, okay, Brad, when doing a data capture, how do you answer the client when they ask, what, sh what should I put in here? Um, Brad, I, I think that's a, a really important point. Um, and I, I think I've made a living, um, and, and you've been around me a long time, knowing um, I talk a lot about my family because I talk about um, my, my, you know, what I've done. Like the classic one at the moment is, I was having a chat with Tim this morning, um, is we're going down that track of uh, in Sepepa, um, enabling our Sepepa members uh, once they've done, they, they become SEPEPA members uh, to do an additional course uh, through SEPEPA, um, with it, which is basically an ethics and trustee and professionalism course uh, to enable them to be advisory board members. Um, and then the purpose out of that is that really, if you have a look at um, uh, your own personal situation, uh, and look, I'll, I'll make no bones about it, um, with my personal situation, I've got um, on my umpteenth marriage. So everyone should know from the way I talk about family provisions, I should have absolutely no assets in my own name, which is fine. But then I need to work out what's going to happen in the, the trust that I leave behind. Um, and the issue about that one is that my wife is not, um, I've got a wife and daughters from a different marriage, which I want to look after. So the trust will be split. But to put any of them as trustees or directors just isn't going to work. I don't mind them being directors of the trustee company, but I'd want to have an advisory board alongside them to guide them along the way. Um, now, whether that advisory board is the power of veto or whether it's just simply a, uh, an advice board is an issue. So what I do, Brad, I just talk about it. And I know you've got, you know, you've got a lot of stuff um, as well that you can pull up from families and also for clients and you can talk about it well in my position I've said this um, I've had other clients that do that but at the end of the day they're the ones who actually have to make um, that that choice around it um, I personally uh, with the data capture to be brutally honest uh, the way I do with clients is I prefer to do zoom meetings I have the light your docs interview questionnaire open um, I'll ask them the question and tell them that I'm typing in the response um, I type it in and then I'll say look what I've done is I've put this in is this correct and, and they're going to review it anyway later and they'll say yes and thing is I've got then of course it's going to be recorded I've then got a, a record of that as well I've even done moat and castles where I've done the whole thing by interviewing the client for about an hour and a half to two hours so that's included EPOAs, protector, SMSF, wheels, the whole thing. And then obviously, you know, you, you feed it out over them. But there I've actually done, all I've done is just typed in exactly what they've said to me. And that's, that's the best thing that you can do if you can do that rather than data captures. Uh, one of the services we will be building um, with Abbott and Morley um, very shortly in the future um, is... Um, where you don't necessarily, where you get a data capture, you don't necessarily feel as though after today's session, you feel as though you're not comfortable where it is, for example, it might be will or whatever. With that data capture, you can send it to us at Abbott and Morley, and then we will provide that document. So you'll still charge the, the client the fee, but we'll then go and provide um, that document based on the data capture that your client provides. And that's just going to be a, a different service there for you. But we've built up a, a really good legal team now um, at Abbott and Morley. Again, just focused on that SEPEPA and the SMSF space um, so that we can, you know, we've got resources around uh, the ability to do that, which we didn't have before when um, Tony and I were just by ourselves.
You know, let's uh, let's go and have a look at accounts and super. And again, if you're not if you're not on the Abbott Morley app, if you want to ask us any questions, so uh, what I'd say from a technical perspective, um, you can go to Light Your Docs and ask a question there. But it ends up coming to us anyway, gets bounced around or gets lost in the system. You're better off just going to Abbott and Morley and asking us a question. You know, if it's a basic question, we don't mind answering that. Um, it's good. Uh, every day at one thirty, we have um, case sessions, so we go through any queries that are just coming through. So what you have to do is get the Abbott Morley app, jump on, you get a login and then just ask us a question and you'll know that that'll get responded to really quickly. Um, plus, you also know there's going to be four lawyers looking at your case every day rather than bouncing through, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so in terms of um, accounts and super, the introduction of the Financial Service Reform Act in 2001 um, heralded a new era of financial advice reforms that, whether by design or otherwise, included member super interest as a financial product. It was pretty bizarre when it first came out. I wrote a whole book on it. But for large super funds, that makes sense as a member is turning over the hard-earned SGC to a completely independent, faceless super trustee and behind the scenes fund manager to look after their life savings. Because prima facie of financial product is, I give money to someone, which they actually call a contribution, believe it or not. I might give money to a managed fund and then they go and invest on my behalf. The same thing with super, I'm giving money to these faceless trustees. So quite, you know, I, I believe it should be caught up. But when it's your SMSF, when you are the trustee, you know, I'm just not quite sure about it. But anyway, what were they also thinking in terms of SMSFs? Uh, did they try one, well, one size fits all approach? So that SMSF member was also caught, although by law they were required to sign off on all investments of the fund. I don't know, but it never really made sense to me. Um, luckily, there was an exemption for accountants to establish and wind up SMSFs, uh, but that across the board exemption was replaced with much fanfare by the limited license for accounts, which clearly has not worked. It was, anyway, just it just didn't make sense. So to try and bring in, and for the planners, um, you know, I feel sorry for the planners uh, on this call is that, um, uh, really, when it comes around to it, um, if you want to just talk about contributions or uh, if you want to do pensions or whatever, you have to do a statement of advice. And anyone, if you've seen a statement of advice, they're quite detailed. Um, and it's a lot of work to do a statement of advice, which you're just not going to recoup. Can you imagine um, doing a statement of advice for a client setting up an account-based pension? Um, it's, it's just not worth it. It's just like, you, you'll see when we get around to tax agents, you say to clients, well, you're over 60. One is we can get you retired over age 60. Um, and we did this in the course. Absolutely. Once someone turns 60, you can turn, get them retired, even though they might be working 80 hours a week. And we went through how that was possible during the course. Then you say, well, what we can do is with your super, if we set you up uh, in a pension, then it means the underlying assets um, in the fund that represent um, those pension assets are going to be tax-free in the fund. So you've got a choice. The money you've got in super at the moment is taxed at 15%. But if we set up a pension, it's effectively tax-free. Which would you prefer? And then uh, up to them, you can't tell them the amount, but you, again, you can educate and elucidate for them as well. Now, um, let's go through, no, we're going to go through, you know, what the law is, asset guidelines, so on and so forth. So in terms of the Corporations Act, um, Section 764A provides that, um, uh, and 1G provides a superannuation interest um, is uh, effectively a financial product, so it deems it to be. Whether it is at law, um, as I said, I think with a retail product, absolutely. If it went to retail, so if it went SMSF, I don't believe it would be a financial product under the general definition. So they've, they've deemed it to be. Surprisingly, though, they didn't go in and say, well, superannuation, normally you go in the definitions, you say superannuation product is giving money to someone else and they invested on your behalf, you know, so on and so forth. Much the same as like a financial product definition, but they didn't do that. They referred it back to the CIS Act. So here I am, finding out whether I need to be licensed, and then it drags me back to the CIS Act which talks about um, uh, beneficial interest in a superannuation fund. And that's the important one. And I haven't got time to go into it, but 
The important one is uh, who am I advising? So um, the Corporations Act in this instance deals with consumers. So we're advising a member that potentially is a financial product, but it, I, I haven't got time to go into it today, but you'll see an investment strategy can be completed by accountant or tax agent. It is not a financial product. So you don't need to be licensed. I can effectively go and do an investment strategy for any client. I don't need to be a lawyer. I don't need to be anything. My brothers can, anyone can, because you're advising the trustee. What you can't do is you can't go down and say, well, I, I think you really should have 100% or 90% in um you know, ANZ shares because they're paying really good dividends with franking credits, which is going to reduce the tax um, on the fund. Now, you can go and say, well, I think you should invest in shares with the imputation credits because that's going to reduce tax on the fund. You can't say that magic word ANZ if that makes sense because that is talking to the trustee about investing in a financial product, if you make sense. But if I'm just saying, well, you know, you're doing an investment strategy which has to be between these benchmarks, then you are a okay now so that means is that if we move away from the trustee level so the trustee level is going to be you've got to think in your mind who you um, discussing it with is it going to be an investment or insurance product then if it's a trustee absolutely if you're dealing with a member um, what's a beneficial interest well a beneficial interest is becoming a member in the first place because you're going to have an interest uh, in that fund so when you're talking about a member, becoming a member, absolutely. Uh, when you're taking a lump sum out, that's dealing with a beneficial interest, starting a pension, dealing with a beneficial interest. I'm not sure about um, doing an SMSF will or B2BM because they're more contingent. So they're really not dealing with a product at this stage because it's just something that potentially will happen in the future because if I die and there's nothing left in the super, then it's, it's immaterial anyway. So... We have a look at contributions, memberships, lump sums, pensions, all of those are dealings with it. So you've got all those ones down there. And again, question mark around a BDBN. Um, interestingly, from this one, and this is where Abbott and Morley is quite happy and you know all the other legal firms, um, there's a specific exemption under 766B of the Corporations Act. Um, so the following advice is not financial product advice. And sorry about my highlighting. It looks pretty ugly, but anyway. I had the cat on the lap at that time. Advice given by a lawyer in his or her professional capacity about matters of law, legal interpretation, or the application of the law to any facts, um, except as may be prescribed by the regulations, which there are none around this, and the same with tax agents. Any other advice given by a lawyer in the ordinary course of activities to a lawyer that is reasonably regarded as a necessary part of those activities. So for that one, we can, you know, as long as we can talk about establishing an SMSF. Uh, the key criteria, the different sorts of SMSFs. You know, is it going to be a, a standard SMSF? Is it going to be a family SMSF? Or are we going to use a, a leading member SMSF? They're all, all, all of them are completely different. So we have to go down and drill down into each one of those. Likewise, you can do the same thing with the tax agent. So advice given by a registered tax agent or BAS agent um, uh, that is given the ordering course of activities is such an agent that's reasonably regarded as a necessary part of those activities. So, for example, you'll see, and ASIC has given their guidelines around this, and I think that's important. Um, so when we have a look at um, Info 216, which came out in 2018, uh, and I only just looked at this two weeks ago, so I've got the, the current one, so it's still current um, as of May 2022. Uh, that looks at uh, four areas. Uh, first off is a licensed account. So remember that limited license. So the, this ASIC guidance note, guidance note talks about accounts and tax agents exemptions for providing SMSF services. So let me get this one. Accountants and tax agents exemptions from prov for providing SMSF services for licensing. So you don't need to be licensed. If you are a limited license account, none of this is going to apply to you because you still have to do your SOA and all that. So we've had a number of accounts who've dropped out from that limited licensing regime because they're paying quite exorbitant fees really for, for no benefit in the long run. Um, accountants, as I said before, investment strategies are okay. We're going to have a look at uh, when it comes around to S setting up an SMSF. Um, if, uh, remember, we looked at the earlier questions, um, right or wrong, um, that if a client comes to you and says, I want to set up an SMSF, 
then you, you can go through and say, well, well, standard SMSF is a basic one, you know, mum and dad, family SMSF, you know, can go up to six members and all that sort of stuff. Whereas a leading member SMSF, um, you can, um, uh, not all members need to be directors or trustees. There's a bit of protection there. Plus uh, the leading member has veto power over all decisions. And really the, the fund is built for bloodline purposes. So you've got three different ones you can choose. Uh, you choose which one you want, and then you'll see if you do that um, on our site or on the Lightyear Doc site, that, that site there, um, effectively out will come an exemption letter, which is um, required under Corporations Regulations 71295D, and basically says that um, this is a letter from Abbott and Morley, um, that the SMSF has been established um, based on your request for an SMSF um, to let's say, you know, to Bradley Smith. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, Bradley Smith is not, um, is not licensed, uh, nor suggested he is licensed. Um, and then importantly from that, that um, if they want, uh, they you know, can go and see someone who is licensed to do so, which clients don't do. Now that's if the client comes to you and asks for an SMSF. Alternatively, um, you can't necessarily go out and recommend and say, look, what are you doing with your money in Australian super? It's you know dodgy, they pay a lot of fees. I'm not saying that that's the case, but you can't do that. You've got to get over the SMSF. And, and this is going to be an interesting one with, um, can you imagine if, let, let's say the Liberal Party, the LNP gets up and they put in place um, that whole SMSF rate, sorry, the whole superannuation regime where people can use their uh, super um, for, uh, the purposes of um, uh, doing a home, how they're going to cover that under the Corporations Act. It's going to be, and can you imagine the property spookers? It's, you know, usually, well, we've seen what's happened and that's where there's been a lot of issues around it. Tax agents, as we said, ordinary course, we'll have a look at what the um, uh, ASIC says and ASIC's the regulator around all of this. And SMSF advise administrators, um, generally, you just got to be careful um, yeah. I think SMSF advised administrators just got to be more careful about the CIS Act rather than all of these um, as well. So um, there's a whole lot here around that given time, but I'll be sending these, Chris will send these slides out to you later today. There's um, a one hour of um, technical CPD on this one. Um, now you may provide advice on establishing operating um, structuring or valuing an SMSF without a license. So they're telling you you can do that. Where you're relying on this exemption, if your client's a retail client, under Regulation 71295D, we know I talked about that, you must provide a written statement to your client that you're not licensed to provide financial product advice and they should consider taking advice. Now, this is not me saying this. This is this ASIC information sheet. The advice you give about establishing, operating, structuring or valuing an SMSF must not amount to an explicit or implied recommendation to establish an SMSF or to acquire or dispose of an interest in an SMSF, which means lump sums and pensions. This is the, this is the big one. However, we recognise that advice given to a person about the establishment of SMSF may also carry an implicit recommendation the person acquire an interest in SMSF, which is you know, becoming a member, rolling over, et cetera. Therefore, you're more likely to be able to rely on the exemption when your client has already made a decision to establish the SMSF before seeking your assistance to take the next steps. For example, you may recommend the best structure for an SMSF, you know, standard, family or leading member to suit your client situation after made a decision to establish an SMSF. And again, that's the, those of you who've been through that SMSF course, we went through all that. That's building up your competency standards so you don't get caught in uh, negligence. Um, so with contributions, and this is primarily again for tax agents. Uh, let me just put my little head down there. Uh, under the exemption, so these are exemptions, so you don't need to be licensed. So registered tax agent, remember section 766B5C, uh, may provide advice on any tax implication of contributions in an SMSF, and that's part of the Tax Agents Act anyway, such as the client's eligibility to make concessional, non-concessional contributions, the tax treatment of those contributions. For instance, a tax agent can use a client's total super balance to advise their clients on the, and that's $1.7 million, Unused concessional contributions can carry forward. Remember that only applies if their super is less than um, 500,000. And then the non-concessional contributions cap in the two year or three year bring forward period. However, they cannot recommend that a client make a particular level of contributions 
but they can advise on maximum level contributions a client can make. This is because the decision maker particular level contribution involves um, considerations other than tax. Um, so the rest is about spousal contribution. So it's much the same as I said before. So that's that's super. Pensions, the same thing. I didn't put in pensions, but you can um, uh, advise on uh, pensions around the tax exemption, uh, but you can't tell the client to then go and, oops, I'm getting a bit big there. You can't tell the client then to go and um, set up a pension. It's up to them. And look, if it's tax exempt, I mean, what client's not going to do that? Scary thing is uh, I see so many people come to us um, and because um, accounts aren't aware of this exemption, the clients, I saw one client the other day who was 67 and still in a TRIS. Um, and the account wasn't even aware that TRIS isn't part of the exempt pension assets. It was just like a crazy situation. And But a lot of that is the fear that you can't do these things. But again, I've shown you what those exemptions are. Um, have a look at the ruling. As I said, don't worry about investment strategies. In fact, if you don't help them on investment strategy, I can tell you, you're more liable to get sued underlying investments. Make sure, please, all of you, that you get investment strategies for the client, you help the client build investment strategies. The problem is if there is no investment strategy or you're running that zero to 100%, which is not investment strategy, according to the commissioner's guidelines, if there's any investment losses coming up, if there's a fall in the marketplace, they can be recovered against you and also the auditor under um, section 54C and 55.3. So the first thing is you need to go out to clients 1st of July this year, there's a letter on the Light Your Doc site and basically talk about um, doing investment strategies crucial. If the client says, no, I don't want to pay for the service, that's fine, but it's better to go out and ask them. If they come back, then, you know, you're basically covered. Okay, what's getting, so we've done super. We looked at tax agents accounts, your exemption there. We looked at tax advice as well. Um, now what we're going to do is look at um, legal advice. And I've already sort of given an indication on that. So uh, this is a 1938 case, Reed Matthews. Uh, the court held that the work, and I love this. This is, this is I love some of this old school talking, um, talking writing, right? Uh, the court's held that the work of the mere clerical kind, such as filling out of skeletal blanks or drawing instruments of generally recognised and stereo type forms affecting the conveyance or encumbrance of property, such as a simple deed or mortgage, not involving a determination, that's important, not involving the determination of the legal effect of special facts and conditions should be generally regarded as the legitimate right of any layman because it involves nothing more or less than the clerical operations of the now almost obsolete Scrivener. The Scrivener was eliminated in England by the 1804 Act, and they were people who used to just do data captures and write into to documents. The court went on to say that where an instrument is to be shaped from a mass of facts and conditions, the legal effect which must be carefully determined by a mind trained existing law in order to ensure a specific result to guard against others, more than knowledge of the layman is required and a charge for such services brings it definitely within the term practice of law. So again, I think this probably goes a little bit beyond the data capture. And I just like to read this to you again, because that this is the key to me. And I think most of us, again, the same way financial planners and AFSLs have bluffed us around accounts. Uh, likewise, lawyers tend to bluff around this. As I said before, based on, remember the, the um, Sinclair case, I've seen tax um, barristers going out and saying that tax agents um, probably can't give uh, tax advice, but then you've got the Tax Act or Tax Agents Act, which allows it. Anyway, let's go back. The court held that the work of the mere clerical kind, such as filling out of skeletal banks, blanks, or drawing instruments of generally recognised as stereotype forms effectuating the conveyance or encumbrance of property, such as a simple deed or mortgage, not involving the determination of legal effect of special facts and conditions, should be generally regarded as a legitimate right of any layman, not even talking about someone saying like any layman, because it involves nothing more or less than the clerical operations of the now almost obsolete Scrivener. So I think that that sort of gives us a bit of an idea about, again, um, look, my preference in the modern day, I've told you about doing the online Zoom and then getting the client to do the um, 
uh, the, the words and you can simply say, particularly if there's a, a bit of form filling in there, you know, when you're looking at wills. Wills are probably, if you look at it, um, so if I look at it along the lines, companies, no problem, discretionary trust, no problem, leading trust, no problem, because they're deeds, we've got that. Mortgages, no problem. Loan agreements, no problem. Div 7A loan agreements. Trust distributions, um, there's a bit of work to be done there, but you obviously got to make sure you get the clients factor there, so there's no dramas about that. Um, EPOA is no problem. That's just a straight data capture. And, you know, God, everyone does, does those ones. Residential leases, no problem. Why is that? Real estate agents do, the, do them day in, day out. Um, doing a living trust. Um, potentially yes and no. Well, living trust is where it starts to balloon out into subtrust. Um, you may need to take a lot of um, data from that one, and that's where AM must come in. Um, in terms of wills, um, wills are a completely different beast. Uh, wills, I would say that you're okay, but again, provided you sit down with them um, and either get the data capture, I've seen some excellent data captures come through Um uh, using the Lightyear Docs data capture or the change GPS one and just get that data and put it in and then send it off to the client for review, uh, which is important. Or alternatively, get the Zoom, put in, for example, what you want to happen, particularly where there's other things, and then you can say, like, for example, I want to set up a testamentary trust um, and then you can say, okay, well, you've got children under the age of 25, do you want to limit blah, blah, blah? And then you simply read it back to them. And if they say yes, then you're basically a-okay because they're giving you that, that data real time that was recorded. So that's why I do it. Um, this is a really interesting one. Um, so this is in Western Australia and, and a lot of lawyers, I don't know what happens over in Western Australia. It's a bit of a, what I believe, a bit of an outlier, but legal practice board versus computer accounting and tax. And I've spent a lot of time on this presentation. So this is giving you all the, all the juicy stuff. Um, in relation to the application material part of Legal Protections Act, I note the following from the Legal Practice Board versus said It's been generally accepted in this state, and this is West Australia, in the particular context of Section 71, the notion of drawing and preparing a document uses involves the use of the intellect to compose the document, the use of the brain to select the correct words, to put them in the correct sequence so the document expresses the intention of the parties. That's Green and Hoyle. Um, it is on the basis that in this state, the mere routine filling up of a document, which is in the form of precedent, has generally been regarded as merely a clerical or ministerial function, and that more than this is required to constitute the drawing um, or preparing of a document for the purposes of Section 77.1. So congrats on all of you for being this, because when you come to me, you're always going to get a deep dive. You know, this is, this is um, I think, you know, to borrow from, okay, this is, um, this is the signal, this is the real stuff. It's not the rubbish noise about, you know, this is what it is. We've got to go to the heart of the matter. We've looked at ASIC, we've looked at the cases, um, and we've looked at it across the whole um, spectrum of thing, even the acts as well. Um, so again, Justice Simmons, it seems to me on the evidence uh, before me, I should find beyond a reasonable doubt that the provision of the trustee to involve the respondent directly or indirectly performing, carrying out, or engaging in any work in connection with the practice of law. While true it is the trustee was shown on the website for the respondent as a product, it was like the trustees in Marble, the complicated document. It was a document that the respondent required a few days to complete in accordance with the instruction of Mr. Kingsbury. There's no evidence before me that the respondent had explained it was simply performing a clerical function. So again, um, and you'll see this is why when you're doing uh, wills or EPOAs through our system, um, that there's that letter you want to tick that has been provided from a data collection that's then been um, uh, completed by um, the client and that you're simply, you're not holding yourself out to provide legal service. So that's absolutely crucial on that one as well. But that sort of gives you a bit of an idea of, of where we're sitting. Um, I've, got, uh, I've got a few minutes if you need be, so please open it up for questions. Uh, I've got four or five minutes. Uh, again, if you need help, jump onto the Abbott Morley app. Um, you can get it um, just on you know, Play Store or whatever the, the app store for uh, Apple is. Uh, go on there, ask us a question. Um, if you've got something uh, specific matter you want to do, um, please put that on there. Uh, we can set you up into a separate channel. Um, you can ask us questions. Uh, we were on the, um, on the other day with uh, one of our advisors. 
um, and he asked us like a whole range of questions and, and there was actually a dialogue happening at that time. You don't get that with a legal firm. So it's a great system. Um, you know, have a look at Abbott Morley app and then uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, we've got a couple of Q&As. Um, we've got some good stuff coming up. Make sure you're around um, from a perspective of contributions. Um, I do an LM SMSF for a client via LYD template. How should the invoice be worded? And imagine it should refer to Abbott Morley, but how specifically? Um, actually, if I was doing it, that's a really good um, question, Arthur. If you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'll just put in the chat uh, what I would do. Um, let's just go through um, and I'll put it up here. Um, so what I would do is I put um, um, preparation of um, a leading member, SMSF, um, bloodline style superannuation fund based on um, your data and um, Abbott and Morley legal precedents. So I would use that. So you might want to just um, take and scrape that one um, and do that because it doesn't hurt. And on, honestly, Arthur, that's a fantastic question you've got. I would do that for companies. Um, I would do that for particularly, in fact, it, if you ask me, I believe the, the toughest out of everything is the preparation of trustee minutes, distribution minutes. Because if you get that wrong, oh my God, you know, that's the, the toughest one there. So I, I would, I would again, um, I, I think that's even further out than um, the wills. Um, if you've got, as I said before, uh, with the leading member SMS of that, if you've got a will and you're not comfortable um, going through that process, and remember, from my perspective, uh, to be really honest, I don't think clients should have um, any assets in their estate when they die. Um, and, and likewise, for you, can I just give you a heads up? We're going to go into pretty troubled times. And you can all see that clients shouldn't have any assets. Um, they should have assets in their own name, but they shouldn't have any net wealth in those assets. You need to go and do protectors for yourself, protectors for your clients. Absolutely crucial from here on in, which then alleviates the will problem. So then you can just do a really basic will for them, uh, which is absolutely crucial. But again, if you're getting into something really complex um, and you need help from Abbott and Morley, just jump on. So we're about to, after this session, I'm about to go on at 1.30 and jump on a session with a client. Uh, where we're going to go through their particular issues. I guarantee you um, probably about 92 times out of 100, um, I will generally end up with a living trust or a family protection trust simply because um, that we know that there's going to be some disputation down the track. And we use SMSF testamentary trusts. But again, if you need help, um, feel free to come to us. We'll charge you a fee. As I said, we will be bringing in a a low cost version um, where you simply send us the data capture, we'll build all the documents and flip them back to you. And then you just charge whatever. Um, and then you'll be able to charge rather than put on precedence there, you'll be able to put on work provided by Abbott and Morley li uh, lawyers. Lies, that's terrible. We're not liars, we're, we're nice people. Um, so um, do tax agents need to be part of an association to give SMSF advice? No, not at all, not at all. Um, so, Sophia, that's a really good question. Uh, ASIC, so I'm not going to say grant. ASIC um, is um, saying no, because remember, tax agents, you, you're, you're no different from uh, lawyers um, at all. So you're exactly the same as lawyers. We've got the same exemption. So, again, if you think of all the lawyers have done B2B ends, it's crazy. So you're in a good position, but just bear in mind um, what the, if we're talking about contributions, tell clients coming up, their contributions dispense account, absolutely. We can put in 27 and a half this year, 27 and a half next year, and uh, we can transfer it. Which one do you want to do? How much do you want to put in? It's up to them. Does that make sense? Um, and then we'll come and say, well, I've got a $200,000 liability. Um, and then, you know, I want to reduce my 
tax as much as possible, you say, well, let's go for broke. Um, so make sure you come to those contributions. I've got some awesome ones, awesome strategies there for you in the next uh, few weeks. Anyway, we're getting the end of a time. Look, thank you very much for um, uh, coming on to this little podcast. Again, it's we go, we've done a deep dive. Um, uh, feel free to use um, Avatar Morley, get on and, and utilize us. We're building up our resources all the time and we want to be very uh, time uh, apparent for you anyway. Um, and really appreciate all your time. Well done. And uh, we'll see you again very shortly. It's Grant Abbott signing off. <laughs>